So let's start the next uh, session of Speakers Masha Feast. Um hi everyone. Uh thanks so much for organizing this this really wonderful workshop and having me here. I've uh, learned a ton already. Um and um yeah, so today I'll tell you a little bit about um dielectrics for dark matter detection. But since I think I'm the first theorist, maybe, uh, to speak so far, I thought I would give a little bit more of an overview. Uh, I think we've had a lot of nice discussions already, so this is a bit redundant, but um, bear with me and we feel free to ask questions. So, um, you know, as much as we uh, love or hate, this point in, in history, uh, we're living in the age of the standard models where we've we've uh, discovered a general set of particles and parameters that describe our universe, not just the underlying particles uh, model, but also the um, of cosmological evolution we understand in a great amount of detail. But of course, uh, many open questions remain and we've discussed some of these uh, already um, there is motivation from both theory and experiment uh, that there is going to be a lot of um, physics beyond, uh, there has to be physics beyond the standard model. Uh, what I'll focus on from the theory side is the theoretical puzzle of the strong CP problem, which points us to new mechanisms and particles to resolve it. Uh, experimentally, of course, we know that there is dark matter um, and a, potentially a bigger dark sector that completely dominates the energy density in our universe. So we know there has to be something else out there that we haven't discovered yet. And more abstractly, we think that there are, has to be new physics at very high scale. We don't understand how gravity and the standard model ultimately fit together. And there's many things that point to, to uh, new high scale physics, some of which we hope uh, we can test indirectly because we'll never be able to reach them uh, on the ground. And uh, as a theorist, one of the ways that, or just in general, I think all of us like to think about um, thinking about organizing these problems in terms of uh, symmetry properties um, and uh, symmetries and conservation laws are central to our understanding of uh, the current state of um, particles and interactions. And then, of course, they can be continuous or discrete. Uh, we've talked a lot about discrete symmetries and uh, uh, parity and time reversal. We can also have trans, uh, continuous symmetry, there's like translation symmetry, which then leads to momentum conservation. And um, this is, uh, you know, not just a nice way of organizing our thinking. Uh, this has led to actually successful uh, predictions in uh, the past. Uh, perhaps the, the simplest one that, that's evolved over the last century. Uh, so that also tells you that sometimes we have to be a bit patient about these new uh, ideas is that is the idea of taking momentum conservation seriously enough to propose the existence of a new particle. So when uh, in beta decay, there seems to not be uh, both energy and momentum conservation, Pauli in 1930 proposed the existence of a neutrino which uh, just eight years later, even though it was still a very hypothetical part, particle, was incorporated into Vete's theories of stellar nuclear synthesis. So that brings in some astrophysics on how we can look for these new particles. And then direct detection didn't come for another 20 years, where they were seen in direct proton capture. They were incorporated into theory of electroweak uh, interactions. Uh, and electroweak, uh, so um, bringing us to higher energy scales. And more recently, they were discovered um, robustly detected in cosmological data. So we know there are, you know, there's an abundance of relic neutrinos from the hot big bang all around us. And now we can use them as detection tools um, for various things. So um, the standard model uh, uh, that is part of the success and it's again, a minimal set of parameters that accurately describes our universe. And uh, one special thing about it is that after we specify the particle content there are some symmetries that are forced on us uh, just by that particle content, and then uh, it's fully specified. So we have, you know, the other forces, uh, electromagnetism, strong force, weak force. We have matter. We have the Higgs sector. Um, there is one important. So there's two important additions, 
Um, so at lowest order and kind of the uh, Wilsonian picture where you just think about the uh, lowest order interaction or dimension four operators, this is all there is. Um, one thing that's missing is of course, uh, so Mara Wadi talked about a bit, uh, oops, working. Oh yeah. Uh, so um, at the same order, we do expect CP violations in the strong force. There's no reason why this term should not be there in the standard model, just like all the other ones. It's consistent with everything we understand, but unlike all the other coefficients, this theta coefficient seems to be less than 10 to the minus 10, so that's the strong CP problem. So it should be there along with everything else, but it, it's not. Uh, at the next highest order, we might have uh, neutrino masses, uh, which we do in fact observe. Um, so that would be an extra term in the standard model that's suppressed by some high scale. Um, so, so far everything fits really well, except this uh, strong CP uh, term. And of course, there might be other things beyond this nice and compact description, like new forces or new particles that are not necessarily part of, part of the standard model. Uh, so to sum up, um, from now on, I'm going to focus on ultralight bosons motivated partially by the strong CP problem, but also um, that the axion specifically is the solution to the strong CP problem. Uh, but more broadly, they're also motivated from this experimental observation of the existence of dark matter. And the important thing is that uh, these um, ultralight bosons have a very, they're, they're excellent dark matter candidates because they're stable and then they don't interact, very, they're stable on cosmological time scales and they don't interact, but they also have a very uh, simple and consistent production mechanisms. So this is something that is important to ask if we're looking for new particles is, uh, are they consistent with everything we know about astrophysics and cosmology, uh, as well as being able to detect them in our experiments. And of course, they're also motivated in high energy constructions, like extra dimension. if you have extra dimensional models, trying to complete the standard model to higher scales, uh, these particles also often pop out. So all of these three bullet points apply to the QCD axion, which of course, perhaps the most exciting out of all the ultralight bosons. Uh, but I think the last two points, and I guess this bracket should be on the last two, yeah, applies more broadly to axion, these axion light particles that we heard about in the last talk, as well as scalars and dark photons. Um, so uh, this is the parameter space. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have axions and axion, axion light particles. On the right-hand side is dark photons. Uh, so this is mass on x axis and the interaction scale with photons, which are typically the ones that we're best at looking for on the y-axis. Um, the QCD axion that solves the strong CP problem is this uh, golden line here in the middle. Uh, it can also be the dark matter along with this parameter space. Um, and you can see it's bounded from both above and below by astrophysics. So these are constraints from uh, the sun and evolution of stars and globular clusters. Uh, at the low end are set constraints using observations of black hole spins. Uh, that exclude very light uh, particles. And you can also um, plot on this plane the axion light particle dark matter preferred region. This is kind of where it's simplest to get dark matter, although if you're more clever, you can populate more of this parameter space. So to me, if you're looking in this plane, you know, this is the most exciting, this is the second most exciting, and perhaps if you talk to enough theorists, you can find some other points in this parameter space as well. Uh, similarly, for dark photons, there's no golden region because it doesn't um, solve an existing theoretical problem, but it can be the dark matter. And in this work uh, by my postdoc David Cincinnati and another uh, former of postdoc uh, at Weiner, they worked out where is the most um, theoretically motivated region for a dark photon dark matter that I'll get to in a second. So basically, the bluer it is, the more exciting it is. Um, good. So, so this is kind of our checklist. We have consistent models for dark matter of the universe in the, the blue regions. They provide, they might provide uh, insights about high scale physics, as you can tell on the X axis here, these are very small numbers or alternatively very high scales. So just as you know, with neutrinos that point us to higher scales, 
uh, than their masses, if we discover this particle, that might give us a hint about some um, UV or heavy physics much beyond what we can um, reach with direct experiments. So it's also intrinsically exciting. It's not just finding one new particle. It can tell us about very high scales. So uh, what do I mean by simple cosmological production? Many of you are already familiar with this, uh, but uh, and even if you're not, you actually are because it's just a damp harmonic oscillator. So we have a scalar field in an expanding universe. Uh, phi here is the amplitude of say the axion field. Um, it usually propagates as a pretty massive wave. So phi double dot plus m squared phi is zero, has plane wave solutions. But then you have an extra damping term from the expansion of the universe, which is the Hubble scale, very large early on and um, drops as the universe expands and cools. So early times, the potential for the field looks like this. Um, and you start with some initial condition that's set by early universe dynamics. And then it oscillates around um, as the universe cools and the friction term becomes less relevant, it starts to oscillate around uh, the minimum. So you can think of the uh, dark matter density on the right or the field amplitude on the left as evolving with time, starting at some initial condition at some very high density where new dynamics and principle can change predictions, which I'll talk about in a second. And then it uh, evolves and oscillates around this expanding, um, this diluting density, which matches very well with what we expect from regular cold dark matter. So even though you should think of this as some oscillating field, much like an electromagnetic field, just with a mass, it does have exactly the properties that you need to be the cold dark matter in the universe. And so today, uh, so this is just over a bit of time. Today, this has dropped to a huge, a uh, huge amount. So the oscillations today are very, very tiny. So we need to look at very precise measurements to be able to disentangle them. Um, so this plot is a bit uh, messy, but um, I'm just zooming in on the previous axion parameter space. So bear with me, you don't have to worry about all the lines. Um, so this is again the axion mass here. On the top length of photons. This is the previous boulder region that used the axion. Um, <clears throat> and uh, here I want to point out to a couple of other production mechanisms. So what I've discussed so far is the inflationary misalignment production, where you start with some random initial condition and you slowly relax to zero. That can get you all the way up to about uh, um, milli electron volts, which is of order of terahertz. Uh, but between there and uh, where there's astrophysical bounds. So this is kind of shaded gray because it only applies to the QCD axion, not to all axions coupled to photons. Um, there's uh, other production mechanisms because as we go back in the early universe, it gets very dense um, and hot. And sometimes it's dense and hot enough to restore um, the symmetry uh, from which the axion arises. When you restore that symmetry and then you go through a phase transition, you form these complex um, uh, networks of um, axion strings, which are shown here. This is from some really nice simulations and uh, this uh, paper by uh, Bushman et al. And um, these are very difficult to simulate and understand and predict exactly what happens. Uh, when you have these axion strings that form, they oscillate around, they emit more axions, you might expect more dark matter than um, just in a simple example that I showed you with the damp harmonic oscillator. And uh, different groups have been working really hard to try to pin down precisely what the prediction is for the axion mass. In principle, there is a single prediction if the universe got hot enough to restore the symmetry, then there should be a single prediction where you get the right abundance uh, to be the dark matter today. Uh, but these are currently results by several groups and you can see that there's still quite a large range of predictions. And so I think um, as an experimentalist, it's often good to not listen too much to theorists and we should just <laughs> cover this whole parameter space uh, to be sure that we're looking to for the, uh, for the QCD axion everywhere um, that it can be. Um, and so that motivates this kind of heavy region between where the heliscope experiments like ADMX are looking 
and, and the, the upper bounds from astrophysics. I think in the afternoon, you'll hear from Lindley about uh, light um, uh, axion detection with uh, with DM radio and network camera. Yes. Yes, but how many uh, strings have survived uh, uh, now? Uh, there are no strings no. left now. Yes. Right. Sorry. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so, this all happens very early on uh, before any of the things we've observed, we've been able to observe. So, this is above the QCD phase transition. When we go through the QCD phase transition, is when the axion gets its potential and the strings. Um, there's actually domain walls that form between the strings, and this, it all collapses together into a big nest, potentially releases more axions. So today, it all be after the PCD phase transition, which is before Big Bang nuclear synthesis, which is like the earliest era that we can probe. Um, this is all happening, and then now there's just a regular um, abundance of non-relativistic axions. People think maybe some some of these might still be relativistic, so there might be a little bit of relativistic axions as well. But yeah. Importantly, in the axion case, there's no springs left uh, today. Um, so this just changes your prediction for how much dark matter there is for a particular axion mass. And yeah, please, please feel free to ask questions um, during the talk, um, as well as after the talk, if you have them. Um, OK, so this brings me to another point, which is extra motivation to look for these heavier, um, he quote unquote, heavier uh, dark matter particles. Um, if you have dark photon, dark matter, so think of this as our photon, but with a mass and very weakly interacting with us, so an additional force that we haven't discovered yet. It can be a good dark matter candidate in principle, uh, but in practice, uh, these guys pointed out that er very early on, again, if we go back in the universe, it's very hot and dense, and the field that uh, gives rise, uh, for example, the Higgs field that the dark Higgs field, the extra particle content that explains why this um, dark photon has a mass. Um, that symmetry can be restored. This is a different type of string network uh, from the previous one. Um, you, don't worry too much. I mean, okay, I'm happy to tell you more about it, but it's not important to the conclusions of this talk. But if you are aware of um, type 2 superconducting phase transitions. This is kind of what happens in the early universe if you have this type of field. Um, and so in this case, these strings actually do stick around and they, um, as they move around, they suck up all of the energy density that's in the uh, nice, smooth background field, the one that acts very much like cold dark matter. And so uh, Will and Jumu pointed out that if you do get to these high densities where you restore the symmetry and form these strings, then this is actually not a good dark matter candidate because these strings don't behave like dark matter. Um, and uh, David and Zach took this on as a challenge uh, to see, is it really true that you can't have your photon dark matter anywhere? Um, so basically there's a couple questions you can ask with the function of the mass of a particle and the interaction strength. Um, we know that there was dark matter at least at uh, when the, the Hubble of the universe and the extension rate of the universe was about, say, 10 to the minus 22 EV. So this is a little bit before um, cosmic microwave background. Uh, so we know that there was some dark matter density around at that time. So if you just plug in that density and say, was there a phase transition at those densities, you can almost model independently exclude kind of all of this region. Uh, and then you can ask, you know, more detailed question of how are you actually making the dark matter? And that uh, gets you uh, to different parts of the parameter space. So they thought very creatively about a lot of different types of models. And uh, basically um, the conclusion is that if you have heavier, um, heavier mass particles, uh, it's easier to construct models where it's the dark matter today. If you have lighter and more strongly interacting particles, it's harder to construct these models. Um, so to me, um, you know, the axion is always the most, more exciting particle to look for, but often the experiments that look for axions also look for dark photons, uh, but perhaps there's more motivation to be looking for them at slightly heavier masses than lighter masses. Okay, so that's... Um, the theory 
uh, motivation and setting up the parameter space. And now I will um, discuss a bit about how people are looking for these uh, for these particles and some potentially new directions that you can do to maximize um, their conversion. So uh, if you like Lagrangians, uh, axials are described by this term here, and their photons are described by this term here. If they're coupling to photons, so F is the, the electromagnetic stress energy tensor. Um, if you're more of a fan of Maxwell's equations, you can think of having a um, new term that effectively acts as a background current. Uh, in Maxwell's equations, that's proportional to either, uh, so B is some external magnetic field that uh, because axions um, are priority on, you need a background uh, magnetic field <coughs> to be able to convert to, um, to uh, photons. So you can have the GA gamma gamma the coupling, this is magnetic field, this is a amplitude of the axion uh, and the time derivative on that, which usually just brings down a part of the mass. You can also have, um, I'll also mention dark photons. So the, the current for dark photons, the background current for dark photons is also proportional to the background density of dark photons. In this case, you don't have to, they have the same symmetry property as photons, so you don't have to apply any external fields to get the conversion. Uh, so these kinds of interactions happen uh, are, you know, just almost automatically exist if these new particles are there. The question is how strong these interactions are. Uh, but in addition to these conversion processes being allowed between, for example, an axion and a photon, or a dark photon and a photon due to the interaction, um, it, uh, you also need it to be kinematically allowed. Um, so unlike our photons, these particles are non-relativistic uh, in our laboratory. Uh, otherwise, they would not be good dark matter candidates. We know dark matter has a velocity that's about 10 to minus three of the speed of light. So compared to photons, they're basically at rest. So comparatively, for example, if you have a photon and a dark photon with the same energy or the same frequency, uh, the photon will have a much shorter wavelength uh, than uh, the dark photons. You can think of, can think about it as just a, a current that's oscill that's constant in space and just oscillating up and down in time. Uh, so how do you actually convert it to light in the lab? So this was uh, you know suggested many decades ago uh, and is now being um, carried out in a very successful experiment at the University of Washington ADMX, which is the first dark matter axion experiment that reaches this QCD. Uh, axion line. So what they do is they say, okay, we have, um, we need to match the dispersion relation of photons to axions. So one way you can do that, you can't really do anything to the axions, but you can trap the photons in some standing mode in a cavity. So your photon has energy, but no momentum. And because we have these boundaries, uh, another way you can think about it is these break the Translation invariants um, that uh, tell us that momentum has to be conserved. And so if you plug in this background current that's given to you uh, by nature, hopefully, if axions are the dark matter, you can calculate what's the power that you get out in this cavity. Uh, it's proportional to some overlap factor, basically how well your B field overlaps with the um, with a excited mode, electromagnetic mode, this coupling squared, so that's just given to, to us by nature. If there's an axion, this, we can't change this, this is the coupling. This is if the axion is a dark matter, we also can't change that, that's a background dark matter density, we know what that is from astrophysics. Um, the magnetic field, we can change if we have enough money, but up to a certain point. Um, the volume of our detector, quality factor, which increases the resonant uh, conversion, and then there's an the overall factor of uh, frequency to make up the dimensions. So out of all of the things that we can control is roughly the volume and the quality factor, maybe the magnetic field um, with um, some extra funding. So this is uh, this is kind of the, the um, analog of what, what you want to maximize as um, people talked about um, 
with molecules, we have coherence time and number here uh, and electric fields. Here we want to maximize volumes and, and quality factors and also magnetic fields. Um, but if we want to go to heavier masses, um, so I was talking about ADMX, which is about you know this big. Um, if we want to go to heavier masses, we which I was uh, discussing uh, earlier as you know important parts of the parameter space to cover. Uh, here is the mass um, on the x-axis and the wavelength uh, on the y-axis. The function wavelength, which is what sets this conversion scale. Uh, is this blue line. So as we go to heavier masses, um, we go, go below the laboratory scale or the AUX scale, and the wavelength shrinks smaller and smaller down to the micron scale all the way up here. Um, so the effective volume is not actually the full volume of your detector because uh, you're only really able to convert close to a boundary. Um, so the effective volume is um, the surface area or pretty, uh, parallel to the magnetic field times the wavelength of the photon that you're emitting or the constant wavelength of the um, of the axion that you're trying to convert. So as you go to uh, low, heavier masses, the uh, wavelength uh, decreases and your power just uh, drops and it becomes very difficult to detect. Um, so in this case, if you're in the limit where the wavelength is much smaller than your conversion volume, then you're not winning by volume, you're just only winning by, by the area. <clears throat> so, uh, and you can see this as you look at this plot, these are some proposals from uh, the bread experiment, which is a very clever way to maximize the area, the conversion area within a magnetic volume. I'll show you a picture later. Um, and these are different types of detectors that they're hoping to use uh, to try to cover some of this perimeter space. Uh, but you can see, even with pretty optimistic uh, detector technologies um, and uh, kind of dividing by a factor of 100 to try to project to the future of how well these readout techniques will evolve, uh, most of these are not even coming close to the uh, bottom of the TCD axiom line. So we need to, uh, even though you know this is an experiment that, that is very exciting and hopefully will be done and will reach interesting parameter space, ultimately we need to do something else to keep increasing the power, otherwise we're never gonna explore this parameter space. So the simplest thing to do is just make more volume. Um, so if you take a, uh, we have the volume, the power is the volume times the Q factor, um, if you can keep coherent conversion across a larger number of areas, then you can win back your factor of uh, volume. So here um, you take a bunch of dielectric layers, you put them together so that the spacing is exactly equal to the wavelength of the photon uh, that you're trying to convert to. Uh, and basically it's like stringing together a bunch of cavities, but they're all still talking to each other because the field propagates through all of these uh, layers together and you can get uh, conversion to visible photons out of one end of the cavity. Uh, so we can look at this uh, equation again and we have the power proportional to the volume times the, the resonance, the Q factor. We have uh, the volume is now the area times the wavelength but times N layers. And the quality factor is also N layers because the more layers there are, the better, um, the more, um, the less leaky the cavity is. Um, so this is, uh, you can enhance your signal with these uh, periodic dielectrics. There's an order one suppression coefficient because um, the contrast between uh, the dielectric and vacuum is not perfect, uh, is not infinite, but you can uh, get most of this uh, as an optimal power conversion. And so this, uh, this is, you know, it's also not a new idea. This has been implemented uh, in an experiment called MadMax that actually I just saw a couple weeks ago, oops, uh, put out a new result uh, where the little sliver of new parameter space, which is exciting at 70 uh, microelectron volts with about, uh, you know, 10 to the minus three bandwidth. Uh, and they're hoping to reach the QCD axion line. Also at ADMX, they were exploring this and 
I like a very bad colleague covered up their plot, but uh, here's their exclusion line for dark photons. Um, and this is our experiment uh, that, that we proposed at higher frequencies with Kimo and Robert, uh, where you just take a little tiny um, dielectric stack, uh, like the halfway stack that you might have on your uh, glasses for an anti-reflection coating. Uh, that Jeff, uh, who was in uh, Sewu's lab, uh, constructed, and we put uh, uh, and Ilya put it together with some very sensitive photon detectors from Carl's lab uh, down the river here. And um, I got to visit the lab when they were putting it in, and so it's a little tiny detector uh, that uh, ran for five days and got some new parameter space, and so we called it uh, Lampos. And so this is for dark photons because we didn't have a magnetic field. Um, so, so far it's just a dark photon exclusion limit. Uh, you can see this is the pink region here, which at the time, you know, got a little sliver of parameter space below um, the solar constraints. Uh, since then, this B, the big xenon experiment did an upgrade and uh, beat us again. But I think it's still pretty impressive that our little experiment that's this big could do better than a you know, multi-ton uh, xenon experiment that ran for many years. Um, and the idea is, again, just to kind of optimize the volume where these particles can convert. Um, so in the last few minutes, I'll just say a bit about future directions, how you can keep trying to maximize this volume, because ultimately, if we're looking for photons, uh, dark photons and axions uh, with, with photons, um, we're just playing with Maxwell's equations, and so we need just, you know, we need to improve, we need to, we need to improve magnetic fields and volumes and detectors. And so I can't build magnet magnets or detectors, but I'm trying to improve the volume. So that's what I'll tell you about. So we can do a uh, chirp stack, which is basically taking the previous uh, analysis, but spreading out the spacing of the layers from the from by about twenty percent or thirty percent, uh, so this is just a way to scan um, without having to swap out things in your experiment, and so the power, uh, the function of mass, will be a little ugly, but you can hopefully characterize it with enough optical measurements, and uh, you can get a broad signal, uh, and ultimately we think you can do you can reach new axion. Uh, parameter space uh, with big, so these are projections of what, what one could do with current uh, detector sensitivities, but larger stacks and uh, adding a magnetic field. Uh, we've also talked to uh, folks at the Fred collaboration where if we add to their uh, mirror additional dielectric stack enhancements, you could already with current techniques potentially reach uh, the QCD axion line. Uh, so these are also projections of what you could do if you add some dielectric layers uh, to uh, the bread um, geometry. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we decided to get uh, um, a bit more disorganized and try to uh, think think back about what is the optimum. So, so the idea is to maximize conversion area parallel to magnetic field within a given volume. And so what's the biggest surface area to volume ratio that you can get? It's a bunch of spheres. Um, and so we asked the question, can you just get a large volume of dielectric powder and use that as a conversion to axion or dark <coughs> photons? So this is work in progress. I'll just flash a couple preliminary plots. Um, so the idea is if you have a single uh, cylinder, you can get some conversion at the surface. If you put many of them together, maybe you can get uh, a large amount of conversion. Uh, this seems to be a really bad idea if you live in one dimension because uh, you get localization of modes in your stack. So if you take our nice power uh, enhancement uh, with an ordered stack and you randomize the, the layer thicknesses by one, five, or 20%, we get these wild spikes. 
so that the overall power that you're converting as a function of frequency is still the same, but no one's going to believe you if you set a limit with this mess here, uh, or if you discover something with that mess here. But when you go to higher dimensions, things become more organized because there's many more uh, ways for light to propagate and the destructive interference gets washed out. If you take a single cylinder, the power is a function of uh, axion wavelength compared to the cylinder size, of course, has these big uh, oscillations. Uh, but if you take a bunch of them together, you just add them incoherently, you get this nice smooth power curve where you have geometric optics and Rayleigh scattering at high. Uh, uh, geometric optics when your wavelength is much smaller than the size of the cylinder and Rayleigh scattering as you go to higher uh, wavelengths. Um, of course, if you put a bunch of cylinders together, it's a little, uh, so this is just like a theoretical addition. Here is a simulation. If you add a bunch of them together, um, you get additional structure of modes that live in this more complicated system. Um, but the overall power enhancement that you get is approximately the uh, absorption length in this powder relative to the powder size. So you're increasing your uh, conversion power by potentially up to a factor uh, of a million or so. If you can get a meter absorption length in a powder, that's a micron scale. Um, and then there's also more messy resonances for friendly scattering tells you that the sky is blue. I live in Seattle, so the sky is usually like this, uh, which corresponds to the region where you have mean scattering, uh, where the wavelength is ordered, the, the, uh, the, the particle size there, it's um, a bit harder to understand how to map the photon scattering properties onto the axion conversion, and we're working on it, but ultimately you might uh, just want to use this high power region here to do the conversion. So let me just flash some preliminary uh, reach curves. So we think with current technology, if we got funding today, we could do these colorful regions here. Uh, and then with a bit more development, we could cut into um, the axion parameter space as well, but this is uh, still uh, in progress. So um, hopefully uh, we switch gears a little bit. So. Uh, hopefully, this is also helpful for the next speakers. I gave you a bit of background on axion and dark photon dark matter and uh, how we can try to really cover the full range of the PCD axion parameter space and that we need to be creative on all of the different uh, fronts where we maximize our different contributions to the convergent power. And uh, we should just put dielectrics everywhere and see if we can test it now. So thank you. Meanwhile, next speaker, please come here to set up the computer. So, any questions? Was well, that a box of the powders? How do you distribute the signal from the noise? Ah, yes. Uh, good. Yeah, I didn't. Ha so, there's many interesting backgrounds. Uh, so, there is. Uh, so, those projections included some some background estimates. Um, there's a few different ways to distinguish the signal, signal from the noise. First, you expect it to be very monochromatic. It will scale with the size of the magnetic field, and we understand the, sc the scaling with the size of the powder. So if you do see a signal, then there's different knobs you can turn to, to check if it's there or not. And then ultimately, you probably want to build a resonance experiment uh, to really pin down uh, uh, the signal in detail. Uh, but yeah, that, that's very important. And and we already know a little bit about what kinds of backgrounds we expect from the lamppost prototype that ran. Um, so there's dark counts in the detector. There might be drink of light from cosmic rays or regular activity. Um, some of these can also be vetoed. So um, yeah, but uh, that, that's the quick answer, but I, I'm also happy to chat in more detail. Yeah. The, I mean, it is true that you can search across the entire mass range, but there must be some regions that are more well motivated than others. Um, well, that's kind of what I uh, was arguing here. So, of course, sorry, uh, I just want to show yeah, the plot no, quickly, otherwise, um, right. So, maybe you can guess which one is the most motivated. It's where most of the experiments are right now. So, so ADMX and these, these guys were looking here because here is where. Um, if you have this misalignment mechanism, you 
start with a typical initial condition in the early universe. And also people thought that the string networks also roughly land around here. Now the string networks are kind of moving a bit to the right, depending on uh, who you talk to. And then uh, we also realized that we know much less about the early universe than we thought. And actually it doesn't really make sense to sort of prior on the initial condition. So that covers this range of parameter space as well. So, so yes, uh, in principle, Perhaps this is the most motivated, but I think given how little we know about the very early universe, you should really look at that whole region. I, I think we have to move on so you can continue your discussion during lunch. Okay. So